SCP-432, Object Class Safe. Description. SCP-432 is a two-door steel storage cabinet measuring 2 meters tall by 1.2 meters wide by 1 meter deep. The exterior of the cabinet is painted matte green and bears no remarkable features except small areas of corrosion and light scratching, commensurate with being left exposed to the elements for a prolonged period of time. The doors of the cabinet are fitted with a basic slide bolt and hasp for a padlock, allowing the door to be secured from outside. The interior dimensions of SCP-432 display significant disparity with the exterior. The doors open into an apparently extra-dimensional space containing a large labyrinth complex comprised of an as yet uncharted series of corridors. The walls, floor and ceiling of the corridors are constructed from a heavily rusted steel and adhere to the same height and width scale as the exterior of SCP-432. The corridors within SCP-432 are lit at irregular intervals by what appears to be regular household light bulbs, secured in the walls by wire mesh fittings. Many of the bulbs are observed to flicker and numerous others are burned out or broken. In places, several large gauge steel pipes have been found bolted to the walls of the tunnels. These pipes are notably cold to the touch and contain flowing water. Although the source and destination of the pipes and water are unknown, many of the pipes observed are in obvious need of repair and leak cold, average of 3 degrees water. Analysis of this water has revealed a low oxygen content and trace amounts of iron oxide, but the water is otherwise possible. The exact size of the labyrinth complex to which SCP-432 connects cannot be accurately measured, as each time the doors of the cabinet are closed and then reopened, the entrance created by the cabinet apparently moves to a different section of the maze. The fate of personnel within the maze when the door is closed is unknown, although remains discovered within the maze suggest starvation is a likely outcome. Other remains coupled with additional evidence gathered during exploration suggest that the labyrinth contains a large predatory inhabitant of indeterminate species. GPS units used within SCP-432 are rendered useless, as are cellular phones. Remote control devices set into SCP-432 are similarly impaired and cease to function after travelling on average of 20 metres into the maze, rendering remote mapping of the internal layout impossible. High gain radio transmissions can be used to keep in contact with personnel within the labyrinth, although significant interference occurs deeper into the maze. If the doors of the cabinet are closed, then all forms of contact with personnel within SCP-432 are severed. Special Containment Procedures SCP-432 is kept in a standard storage area at Sector 25. It is to be kept locked at all times, and the key to the lock kept in the adjacent security station under guard by free Level 3 personnel. No other special containment is required. Additional Notes SCP-432 was discovered in an abandoned industrial complex in UK. It came to the attention of the Foundation after Dr. T. Small heard reports of several homeless people in the area disappearing after staying in the complex. Upon investigation, Dr. Small discovered the cabinet at the centre of an abandoned steel mill, surrounded by a number of sleeping bags, bags of clothing and other personal effects. SCP-432 was unlocked with the door closed upon discovery. After exploring the immediate area but on the entrance, Dr. Small exited SCP-42 and summoned Foundation personnel to transport the cabinet to Sector 25 for analysis. Currently, expeditions have been sent into SCP-432 to attempt to chart its internal geography. To date, D-Class personnel have been lost within the maze. No further expeditions may be made without express permission of at least two Level 4 personnel. Expeditions the standard agreed mission equipment pack agreed by Dr. T. Small and Dr. is One hand torch with three hour lifespan and additional power sources provided up to six additional hours One headset microphone linked to control One shoulder mounted video unit set for wireless transmission Two 0.5 litre bottles of water Two high calorie energy bars Eight sticks of luminous marker chalk Expedition 1 Subject D64502, male, average physique. Subject's background shows a history of aggravated assault and burglary. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters 432. The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates showing a short corridor constructed from the same rusted, corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. 
The floor is formed from rigid safety seal as might be found on an industrial walkways or gantry. The corridor makes a 90 degree turn to the right approximately 5 meters ahead of the subject. Control asks the subject to move around the corner. Subject moves forward as requested, turning the corner into a longer tunnel, the exact length of which cannot be judged due to the lack of lighting. A conventional electric bulb on the wall lights the immediate area, but the light fails to illuminate much beyond 3 meters. Further lights can be observed ahead, though they only illuminate patches of the tunnel. Control instructs the subject to turn on his torch and the lighting is notably improved to the limit of the torch's beam, approximately 20 meters. Control asks the subject to proceed down the tunnel. After approximately 42 meters, a crossroads appears in the tunnel. D64502 asks Control which way to go and Control tells the subject to pick a tunnel. The subject chooses to go left and before entering the new tunnel produces a stick of marker chalk from the equipment pack and draws a large arrow on the wall indicating the direction of the exit. As subject moves into new tunnel, control notes that the video quality has begun to degrade with visible interference appearing on the monitors. Control does not inform the subject of this. Subject walks approximately 5 meters down the tunnel and then stops and asks control if they heard anything. Control replies they did not and asks what D64502 heard. Subject is quiet, as if listening. Then replies in muted tones that he can hear someone banging on the wall in the distance and shouting. Subject becomes agitated and tells command the person sounds fucking scared. Control boosts audio gain on the subject's camera and picks up sounds similar to the subject's description. Repetitive distant banging consistent with someone striking a metal surface with their arm or hand. A voice can be detected, but audio quality is not sufficient to discern words. The subject is becoming increasingly agitated by the sounds. Control informs the subject to move in the direction of the shouts. The subject objects, but after a short discussion with Control about the nature of his employment, he moves forward. After approximately 14 meters, the tunnel turns 90 degrees right and angles downwards in a gentle slope. Video interference is now noticeably increased, and slight audio interference is now audible. Subject has begun breathing heavily and muttering under his breath. Subject continues down the tunnel for approximately 27 meters until the floor levels out again. The subject abruptly stops, crouches and swears. Control asks why he has stopped. The subject remains silent, but breathing has become louder and heavier. Control asks again why the subject has stopped, and D64502 replies he heard a scream and that the banging and shouting has suddenly stopped. Control informs the subject to stand and move forward, but the subject becomes agitated and demands to be allowed to leave. After several minutes of arguing, the subject stands to take a long drink from one of the bottles of water and moves forward again, although slowly. Ahead, the tunnel T-junctions left and right, and Control tells the subject to go right. The subject marks the way back to the exit with chalk and goes right. The tunnel ends in a dead end after 6 metres. Control informs the subject to go back to the junction and take the left tunnel. This too ends in a dead end after only 4 metres. Subject seems to have calmed slightly and suggests returning to the previous T-junction and trying the other tunnel. Control confirms with Dr. who decides to recall the subject and analyse the data collected so far. Control informs the subject to return. The subject moves back through the tunnels following his chalk marks towards the exit. At crossroads, the subject freezes again and asks Control if they heard a noise. Control confirms that they are detecting a sound, but requests D64502 to explain what he is hearing. Subject identifies the noise as wind. At this point, the camera captures a small drift of what appears to be dead leaves blown from the right-hand unexplored tunnel. Subject remarks that the breeze smells stale. Control informs the subject to collect several leaves for analysis and then proceed down the right-hand tunnel to locate the source. Subject collects leaves and complains about the orders to remain in SCP-432, but moves towards the tunnel mouth. As subject nears the tunnel entrance, a loud echoing roar is heard over the audio, similar to a large animal such as a bear or lion. Subject panics, screams and runs for the exit, ignoring Control's demands to investigate the sound. The subject sprints to the exit and collapses in the storage area. Expedition is aborted, the door closed and locked, and subject removed for debriefing. Expedition 2 
Subject is D6411, female, 32, average physique. Subject's background shows an incident of attempted murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Light from the open door behind the subject coupled with illumination provided by the bulbs located at irregular intervals on the walls of the structure light the tunnel for approximately 20 meters. More lights are visible further down the tunnel but are very dim. Control requests subject turn on her torch and move into the structure. The subject complies. The passage continues for approximately 100 meters from the entrance until it ends in a T-junction leading left and right. Subject asks Control which way to go and is told to go right. D6411 marks the route back to the exit with Mark Chalk and proceeds down the tunnel for 50 meters until a crossroads is reached. Control informs the subject to take the left hand branch and the subject marks the tunnel wall and enters the indicated passageway, which is followed for 47 meters until another crossroad is reached. Control notes interference to both the video and audio feeds has begun to appear but is currently negligible. Subject pauses to drink from one of her bottles of water and marks her route back before selecting, without permission from Control, the right hand branch. Control admonishes 6411 but allows her to continue. The passageway makes a 90 degree turn left after 18 meters, then continues straight for approximately 73 meters. Ahead of the subject appears another crossroads, but as the subject nears it, she freezes and reports that she can hear a rhythmic banging coming through the walls. Control boosts audio gain on camera and the sound is picked up. The banging lasts for 73 seconds before it stops. Subject has remained still while listening, attempting to breathe quietly. Control prompts the subject to mark the tunnel wall and proceed left. The subject remains motionless and makes several inquiries into the nature of 432 and the source of the banging. Control firmly reiterates their commands and the subject resumes walking, taking the left tunnel as indicated. Subject has travelled for approximately 150 metres when she stops and aims the camera at the left wall of the tunnel. She observes that all the light fittings in the structure of the structure have been broken. Shards of broken bulb were visible scattered across the floor. Subject continues forward, remarking that she has begun to detect a faint, unpleasant odour. When asked to describe said odour, D6411 replies, Something dead. After a further 24 metres, the subject notices an object in the tunnel ahead and moves towards it. Video quality is now beginning to severely degrade. The camera angle tilts as subject kneels to examine the object, and control asks the subject to explain what she has found. Subject explains the object is a left sport shoe, commonly known as a sneaker. The camera zooms in on the object while the subject illuminates it with her light source. Camera view tilts again as subject suddenly looks down at the floor of the tunnel and emits a loud explosive. The floor of the tunnel is covered with a large quantity of dried brown residue that crackles and flakes as subject moves her feet. Sprays of the residue are observed dried onto the walls. The subject remarks that the substance is apparently the source of the odour and she surmises it is dried blood. The camera tracks several large smears of the substance leading away from the pool up the corridor. Subject's breathing is becoming slightly panicked. Control requests the subject collect the shoe and a sample of the substance for analysis. The subject does so, although complains continuously about the smell and expresses wishes to exit SCP-432. Her request is denied and Control orders the subject to continue onwards. The subject continues down the corridor at a much decreased walking speed and is becoming agitated. Camera view changes repeatedly as the subject begins looking over her shoulder at erratic intervals. Video and audio feed are beginning to become severe, and Control asks the subject to halt while they confer with Dr. Dr. decides to recall the subject, who is now becoming extremely panicked, complaining of hearing footsteps behind the wall to her right. Dr. confirms the expedition is over, and Control recalls the subject, who begins moving back towards the exit at an increasing speed. Once out of 432, the door is closed and locked, and the subject is sent for debrief. Expedition 3. File locked. Administrator clearance accepted. File unlocked. Notes. This file has been locked due to a breach in SCP Foundation policy. The policy breach concerns the promise to never place SCP staff in harm's way, save for D-Class personnel, security and MTF units, except in extreme circumstances. The content of this file is strictly confidential. 
Any leaking of any information within this file is cause for severe disciplinary or execution. SCP-432, Expedition 3. This log has been condensed to the reason for it being logged. D-0987, male 25, was sent into SCP-432 with a standard mission pack. The first 20 minutes was uneventful. D-0987 then stated he could hear sounds of growling near his position and began to grow panicked and agitated. After swearing loudly, a massive crash can be heard over the headset. Camera feed cuts out and D-0987 is presumed dead by unknown causes. After five minutes of failed attempts to re-establish contact with D-0987, technicians prepare to close the doors to SCP-432. D-0987's camera and audio feed are suddenly re-established. D-0987 appears to be running through SCP-432. Following his chalk markers, he can be heard screaming and panting. The sounds of roaring and heavy, fast footsteps are also picked up. The technicians try to re-establish contact. D-0987, can you hear me? What is happening? Report. I hear you. It is chasing me. Fuck. Uh, my arm is shredded. Fuck, help me, please. D-0987, what happened? What is it? How far away are you? It came through the wall. It was in the fucking wall. I'm close. Please help. It's right behind me. At this moment, a huge roar can be heard coming from the audio receiver and from within the cabinet itself. The lead researcher makes the decision to close the cabinet doors. Technicians remove the weights, just as D-0987 can be seen rounding the corner at the end of the corridor. D-0987 spotted. He, he's badly injured. Close the doors. No, wait, please! The technicians close the doors. All communication with D-0987 is lost, and D-0987 is presumed dead. After this, it was decided by the lead researcher and doctor and Overwatch Command to use two D-Class personnel and a technical assistant to attempt to cut through the walls to gather further information on what attacked D-0987. The technical assistant was not to be told any more than the mission directive. The technical assistant was to be armed in case of an attack, but was also to be considered expendable. Overwatch Command has the power to bypass policy in their own discretion. Nevertheless, this expedition is locked, and access is forbidden except for O5 and administrator level clearance. Reminder, leaking any information from this file is grounds for severe disciplinary or execution. Expedition 4 Team is made up of three members, D5891, male 27, D8321, female 32, and technical assistant Equipment packed for this expedition differs from the norm. D5891 is equipped with 10 sticks of luminous marker chalk, one 250mm steel pry bar. Subject D8321 is equipped with one shoulder mounted video unit set for wireless transmission. Technical assistant is equipped with one standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 20 rounds of ammunition, one back mounted oxyacetylene cutting torch. Subjects have been briefed that they are to enter SCP-432, move a short distance into the structure and then attempt to cut through the interior of walls with the oxyacetylene torch. The team moves into the structure with D5891 marking their progress every few meters with luminous chalk. After several turnings, chosen by control at random, the team arrives at a crossroads attached to the wall by a northern passageway are two large steel pipes. The team is asked by control to examine these pipes. The technical assistant places a hand on one pipe and remarks that it is very cold to the touch and that there is a sensation of liquid moving within the pipe. The technical assistant requests to cut into the pipe, but control denies the request, directing the team to follow the pipes instead. The team moves north from the crossroads, following the pipes for almost 300 metres, taking several turnings in the process until the pipes continue through the wall of a dead end. Control informs the team that they should ignite the oxyacetylene torch and cut through the dead end. At this point, the technical assistant moves to the fore and lights the torch. D5891 takes up position behind him with the pry bar ready, and D8321 moves back to cover the other two with the camera. The technical assistant cuts into the wall, attempting to excise a large hole. 
enough to step through. As he begins cutting, D8321 remarks that she believes she heard a noise behind them. The camera angle changes as she looks over her shoulder, revealing the corridor behind the team to be empty. Control requests she turn back and film the cutting. The technical assistant has made an approximately one meter high cut into the wall when D8321 remarks again that she can hear something moving close by and begins looking around. D5891 and the technical assistant appear not to hear her over the sound of the oxyacetylene torch. The technical assistant finishes the vertical cut and then proceeds to make a short horizontal cut to allow D5891 to insert the pry bar and pull out a section of the metal wall. As D5891 steps forward and inserts the pry bar into the cut, a loud roar is heard apparently coming from behind the wall. D8321 screams and begins to back away, at which point the cut section of the wall is seen to bend outwards, pushed by something from behind. At this point the video feed becomes confused as D8321 attempts to flee and the camera is unable to compensate for her rapid movements. Audio transmission is also unreliable due to interference and screams of the team. It appears that a large indigenous life form comes through the hole cut by the technical assistant and assaults the team. Gunfire can be heard, presumably from the technical assistant's sidearm, along with screams from D8321 and D5891. The audio logs also record a loud bellowing, which is currently unidentified but presumed to be made by the lifeform. Video stills reveal that data expunged. Administrative clearance accepted. Video stills reveal that D5891 has been disemboweled by the creature from what appears to be a single blow to the torso. D5891 is presumed dead due to his injuries, which would have proven fatal. Video stills reveal an image of the lifeform forcing its way through the opening in the wall presumably in pursuit of the technical assistant at D8321. Gunshot wounds can be seen on the creature's arm from the technical assistant's firearm, however seem to have very little effect. Subject D8321 manages to return to the entrance of SCP-432, injured and in a state of extreme mental distress. She exits SCP-432 and, before technical staff can stop her, pulls out the weight holding the door open and shuts SCP-432. When the door is reopened, the internal layout has changed, and D5891 and the technical assistant are presumed lost. Subject D8321 is removed for debrief, after which she is terminated. During debrief, it is discovered that a large tuft of animal hair is caught in the harness of D8321's equipment pack. The hair is removed for analysis. Expedition 5 Subject is D8887, male, 19, athletic physique. Tunnel is notable to previous expeditions in that there are no light bulbs on the walls. As subject moves forward, he remarks that there is a large quantity of broken glass on the floor of the tunnel. Subject switches on his torch and proceeds forward to the T-junction, then proceeds left as instructed by control after marking his route. Subject moves through SCP-432, taking turn as is indicated by control. During this time, the subject is careful to mark his route using marker chalk and makes routine reports to control describing any visual or audio impressions of the structure. Subject reports that he can hear occasional distant machine noises through the walls and that the interior of SCP-432 is quite cold. After 45 minutes, subject has travelled approximately 2500 metres through the structure. Video and audio interference is minimal and subject has carefully marked his route through SCP-432 with marker chalk. Subject stops to take a drink from a bottle of water and consume a ration bar. After resting for a few minutes, subject continues and, after taking a turn into the right, encounters three objects on the floor of the tunnel. Subject stops and illuminates the objects with his torch, revealing them to be two crumpled food cans and one bent tin fork. The cans are partially corroded and seem to be quite old. The labels are of a familiar brand of canned beans. Control asks the subject to place the items in his equipment pack for analysis. Subject continues onwards, but after 40 minutes stops and informs Control he can hear something. Control requests clarification, and D8887 remarks that he can hear a faint sobbing or crying emanating from somewhere nearby. Control asks if the crying is male or female. The subject responds that it sounds male. Audio pickup fails to register the sound clearly. Subject is currently stood at a T-junction, and Control instructs D8887 to move in the direction of the crying. 
Subject takes the left-hand passageway, moves 30 meters down the connected corridor, takes a right turn and follows the corridor another 22 meters, proceeds straight ahead at a crossroads and continues for 37 meters. Video interference has begun to increase and control cautions the subject not to proceed too quickly. Subject complains that darkness within SCP-432 is hampering his efforts, then shouts, Hello? Can you hear me? I'm coming! Control admonishes D-8887 for shouting, informing him he may attract attention to himself. Subject asks, What else is in here then? But Control informs the subject to continue along his current route and locate the source of the crying. Subject stops at the next junction and pauses to listen. Audio picks up a drawn out moan or scream, apparently human in origin, after which the crying ceases. Subject swears and asks if they heard the scream, stating it sounded very close. Control asks the subject to proceed forward. The subject complies, although slowly, attempting to move with as much stealth as possible. After 20 meters, the passageway turns right. Subject moves around the corner cautiously. The camera reveals the passageway ends in a dead end. Subject approaches the wall and places an ear against the metal. Subject backs away from the wall hurriedly, hissing expletives. Control asks what he heard, and Subject whispers, There's something behind the wall. I can hear it crunching on something. Subject makes repeated whispered requests to exit SCP-432 immediately. Control confers with Doctor, who agrees to recover the subject. Control confirms the subject may begin retracting his route, which he does so at an increased pace. Subject's egress from the structure is uneventful, although subject keeps looking over his shoulder and requires repeated verbal encouragement from control to prevent the onset of panic. Subject returns and is sent for debriefing. Material is recovered. All documents contained in this file are class 2 clearance requiring two signed approvals to access. All of the following items have been recovered from SCP-432 during the expeditions to date. Leaves. Discovered on Exhibition 1. 12 leaves in total. All leaves are dry and crumbling and exhibit signs of extreme age. Footwear. Recovered on Expedition 2. A single left sport shoe made from rubber and canvas with the logo on the ankle. The branding and manufacturing style dates the shoe to 1982. The shoe shows signs of heavy use, frayed laces, worn soles and scuffed toes and is caked in a fine layer of earth and dust. Dried blood. Recovered on Expedition 2. Scrapings from a large dried blood stain. Tests have confirmed the blood is human, male, typo positive. The blood is too old and degraded for DNA reconstruction. Animal hair. Recovered on Expedition 4. A large tuft of matted brown animal fur with a large clump of skin cells attached to the roots. The hairs are approximately 13 centimeters long, stiff and coarse and smell extremely unpleasant. DNA analysis has placed the creature in the order family. Although noticeable irregularities in the DNA profile exist, suggesting data expunged. Data recovered. Administrator clearance accepted. Suggesting the life form's genetic makeup has been heavily modified to suit its environment. Genetic structure reveals a synthetic protein molecule allowing the life form to adapt to any environment it is exposed to. In this case, superior strength predatory instincts and endurance, capable of causing significant structural damage, the ability to hear and detect life forms from a distance, and withstand moderate to high amounts of damage with no sign of decreased aggression or stamina. Food tins and fork. Recovered on Expedition 5, two crushed and empty cans of Heinz baked beans with meatballs and one tin fork. The cans have apparently been opened with a church key type can opener and the contents consumed. One can contains traces of human blood mixed with the food source, as well as small trace amounts of human tissue. The blood and tissue is mixed with the food source in a manner to suggest it was added to the food prior to consumption. The fork is covered with dried food source consistent with Heinz meatballs and baked beans, as well as traces of human blood and tissue.